In 1962, President Kennedy foresaw the need for an elite unit of special operators to fight against an enemy using unconventional tactics in Southeast Asia. These men would be specially trained in guerrilla warfare to beat the enemy at his own tricks. He needed warriors who would be capable of operating in every arena. He called for men who could reach and attack targets in or under the water. He wanted fighters who could strike suddenly from the air using helicopters. He envisioned troops who could approach a target silently by parachuting from high-flying airplanes. He sought men of courage and stealth who could stalk the enemy over any terrain in the world. When President Kennedy looked for the ultimate warrior, he found it in the form of the Navy SEAL. The history of the modern Navy SEAL dates back to the combat demolition units of World War II. Commander and founder of the Navy Bomb Disposal Unit, Lieutenant Draper Kaufman formed the first naval combat demolition units in May of 1943. Tasked with recruiting and training men at NCDU school in Fort Pierce, Florida, Kaufman placed the heaviest emphasis on his men's physical capabilities. Instructors devised an intense physical training program designed to create men capable of extreme endurance. To this day, the descendants of these units, the Navy SEALs, undergo the most rigorous military training in the world. So vital was the job to be done by the NCDUs that the time and date of the Normandy invasion were changed specifically to give them the maximum amount of time between tides to accomplish their mission. Under heavy fire, these combat demolition units waded ashore to place charges on obstacles and beach defenses. After first clearing several channels under enemy fire, the demolitioners had to wade back out through the oncoming tide to place marking buoys. These channel markers guided the Allied landing craft and troops onto the beaches through clear channels, saving countless lives. Even then, the NCDUs continued to act, clearing away sunken landing craft when they threatened to block the clear channels. Their intense physical training paid off as naval combat demolitioners plied their craft under miserable conditions. This tireless service was not without a heavy price. D-Day casualties among the NCDUs exceeded 50%. On the Pacific warfront, uncharted coral reefs at Tarawa grounded boats hundreds of yards from the beaches. Heavy equipment acted as weights, drowning hundreds of Marines in hidden potholes as they attempted to wade ashore. To preclude this from ever happening again, underwater demolition teams were formed. UDTs were tasked with making beach surveys and removing obstacles in advance of all amphibious landings. Recent NCDU graduates were recruited into the UDT program and given additional training in hydrographic reconnaissance, mapping, and other skills needed for their new assignment. The Normandy NCDUs had not considered swimming skills important. They rode in boats and simply waded or crawled ashore. Pacific operations changed this view, making the UDTs true combat swimmers. All UDT volunteers were required to be strong swimmers and were given additional training on long-distance swimming. The first UDT operation was during Operation Flintlock, the invasion of Kwajalein Atoll in the Marshall Islands. UDT swimmers reconned the proposed landing beaches, making notes of obstacles and beach defenses on plastic slates. Discoveries made by the UDTs caused invasion planners to change the types of landing craft used. After the invasion, the UDTs blasted channels through coral reefs to allow boats carrying reinforcements and supplies easy access to the shore. Similar UDT operations were repeated successfully on island after island throughout the Pacific. One of the most famous UDT operations was carried out on Guam. In order to prepare for the upcoming invasion, 200 UDT men worked round the clock blowing obstacles. As they worked, they were protected by a smoke screen and constant stream of naval and air bombardments. The operation was heroic, but the lasting fame came from a hand-painted sign that greeted the Marines as they waded ashore. It said, Welcome Marines, courtesy of UDT-4. On Okinawa, in an amphibious assault second in size only to the Normandy invasion, 1,000 men from 10 UDTs cleared the way for a half million Allied troops. Thousands of obstacles were cleared from 21 landing beaches. 
After finishing their primary duties, UDTs departed from their normal role by manning machine guns to ward off hundreds of kamikaze planes. While other soldiers were routinely taught to rely on their weapons, UDT men carried only a knife. Most UDT men went to war wearing nothing more than a bathing suit, a mask, and swim fins, creating the legend of the naked warrior. In some quarters, men joked that in order to be in the underwater demolition teams, a man had to be half fish and half nuts. Whatever the UDTs lacked in weaponry, they made up for in courage and ingenuity. Several new methods of operation were created by UDTs during this time. The casting technique was developed to quickly insert and extract swimmers from a target area. New types of hydrographic surveys were devised. Pairs of swimmers reeled out lines, which had been marked at 25-yard intervals. At each interval, one swimmer would drop a weight and mark the depth on a slate. The second swimmer would mark obstacles with buoys and note their locations on another slate. Both the casting technique and the lead line survey were so successful that they are still included in modern BUDS training. The basic underwater demolition team of the World War II era consisted of 100 men and 13 officers. By the close of World War II, there were 34 operational UDTs consisting of about 3,500 men. The end of the war marked the beginning of the demobilization of the teams. By 1946, the last of the wartime UDTs had disbanded and their equipment was sold as surplus. Most of the UDT swimmers who remained in the Navy returned to the fleet. The UDTs, which had previously numbered over 3,500 strong, were now reduced to a handful of men. By 1948, the teams were down to a skeleton crew of seven officers and 45 enlisted men. With the war over and no new mission in sight, it looked like the end was near for the underwater demolition teams. If it was the foresight of Draper Kaufman that had created the teams, it was the insight of Francis Douglas Fane that prevented their extinction. Commander Fane explains how it happened. I took the surrender of a huge Japanese ammunition depot. I swam in with a half a dozen other men. All we had was sheath knives, something like this. This is a Gurkha knife, by the way, but our knives were similar. This was given to me by a Gurkha. And took took over command of this, this seaport. There's a number of small uh, Japanese submarines being built there. But the whole city itself was devastated by American bombing. And we had no trouble at all in swimming in. The Japanese didn't bother us. We were looking for mines underwater that would impede our landing vessel. There was no trouble. And the, the people uh, were very honorable in the way they surrendered. Uh, one of the officers commanding the base wanted to give me his sword. I didn't want his sword. To him, that was his life. So when I refused to take his sword, uh, it was sort of established a bond between us. And we had no trouble with the landing. Everything went very smoothly. But looking over that city and the damage that was done, not so much by bombing, but by burning all the Japanese houses of the wood, I realized how horrible war must have been to those people. I also realized that in the mountains there were all kinds of revetments with guns that would have made our landing uh, very bloody indeed. And I realized that if we were going to come in in future wars, we would have to be better prepared than just swimming in the surface as we did. So I thought of the idea of working underwater all the way working with submersibles out of submarines, coming in surreptitiously at night, uh, being dropped by helicopter in the water. Uh, I envisioned this whole system. Commander Fane did more than just envision a system. He researched, designed, and implemented it. Through his vision and effort, the post-war role of the UDT stopped shrinking and began to expand. Fane worked with scientists and commandos from around the world to form the Submersible Operations Platoon, which was a forerunner of today's Navy SEALs. With the help of underwater photographer Eldridge Fenimore Johnson, Fane convinced the Navy that his projects were feasible. 
Commander Fane explains how Johnson's pictures proved more valuable than words in the efforts to rebuild the teams. But he had this camera. And uh, just as you're doing now, he used to do put everything on tripods and so forth. But I taught him to swim holding a camera, and he just thought that was terrific. He was a tremendous man. He actually walked, went through all of the training that I gave my man, locked in and out of submarines. We went in and out of submarines underway underwater. First time this had ever been done in U.S. Navy history. Stood in the deck, strapped ourselves down at camera to cameras and photographed everything we were doing with swimmers and submersibles going in and out of submarines underwater. So we had a complete documentary of this, and it all came out beautifully. So we cut the film, edited it, and I took it up to the uh, Chief of Naval Operations, who at that time was Admiral Gerald Wright. So we showed this film of all of these events taking place underwater. And he said, my God, how long has this been going on? I said, well, for almost two years now. He said, if you have any problems, see me. <laughs> so that solved our whole problem from, from then on in development of our unit. We got helicopters when we needed it. He made submarines available to us. We've had our men up and down to New London. They were all trained in, in the in the deep sea tank, it was 100 foot deep. So the development was uh, because of, primarily, pictures that showed that this could be done. Secondly, by the plans I was constantly drawing up for the use of swimmers in, in uh, operations, uh, primarily in peacetime drill. But later on in Korea, and I trained men to scout the bottom for mines and uh, developed a, a system of towing men and cables uh, who went along underwater behind a, a surface craft to depths of 50, 60 feet and could spot and mark mines. And this system was used in Korea. This system was used also to some degree in uh, desert warfare just recently conducted in, uh, off the, the shores of uh, Kuwait. Commander Fain ensured the continuation of the teams by actively seeking new ways that the UDTs could be useful to the fleet. UDTs played an important role in the development of the Atomic Navy by helping with A-bomb testing. UDT men conducted pre- and post-blast surveys, collecting radioactive water and soil samples from test sites. Commander Fain recalls his personal experience. I was the first person to dive on the... Uh the crater made by the hydrogen bomb in Bikini, going down about 50, 60 feet there. Uh, it's quite a hole, <laughs> about a mile, about a mile in diameter. And I brought up some huge, giant clams uh, from uh, down there, down 50 to 100 feet. And uh, they're in my wife's uh, sister's garden in. Uh, Yokohama, Japan, some of them today, and they glow at night from the, <laughs> ready, from the from ready, ready. Really? They're still a little radioactive. They will be forever. And so the people all from the neighborhood all come around and have the, make, say their prayers to the survivors of the A-bomb. And, and, and also one of those clowns, which is a pretty big one, I gave to the Anglican church. Uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the preacher there. It's quite a guy, John Bird. He, I sang in the choir at one time. I lived up in the hill near the church. So I gave him one of those shells as a baptismal font. And he said, you know, Commander, the thing about this is that everybody wants to get baptized at night because of the holy light. <laughs> The Korean conflict presented new challenges for the underwater demolition teams. UDTs were called into action to perform mine clearing operations and to mark underwater obstacles. To allow swimmers to operate in cold water, the dry suit was developed. UDT divers put their underwater breathing apparatus to use in covert operations. Nighttime surveying methods were perfected and UDTs began to scout enemy placements. 
It was the UDTs who convinced General MacArthur that Incheon was the most suitable site for a landing. Korea proved to be a turning point for the future role of the teams. UDT training had been modified to include land operations, small unit tactics, and weapons. In addition to their maritime operations, UDTs began conducting inland raids behind enemy lines. They cut off enemy supply lines by demolishing railroad bridges and tunnels. UDT men disrupted enemy food supplies by destroying North Korean fishing nets. They infiltrated and exfiltrated guerrilla soldiers inside enemy-held territory. In short, the underwater demolition teams in Korea, by their actions, if not their name, became Navy SEALs. Unlike the period after World War II, peacetime after the Korean War saw an increase in UDT activity. In 1954, all UDT units were redesignated and assigned new numbers. West Coast UDTs were assigned the numbers UDT 11, 12, and 13. The East Coast became the home of UDTs 21 and 22. UDT men explored the Canadian Arctic for five years, surveying over 4,000 miles of coastline. It was their work which allowed the Pacific Fleet to construct the Dew Line for the defense of the entire North American continent. These Arctic operations spurred the development of a quarter-inch thick foam suit to be worn as insulation under the dry suit. UDT divers found the foam suit to be superior to the dry suit and soon began wearing it alone as a wetsuit. Variations of this foam suit are still used by divers for cold water protection to this day. With the advent of the space program, the teams were called upon once again for help and guidance. UDT volunteers participated in G-force experiments designed to test the limits of human endurance. Early astronauts trained underwater with UDT personnel to prepare for the effects of weightlessness in space. Every space capsule NASA launched was met by men from the teams. UDT men trained with practice capsules to prepare for each landing, whether manned or not. It was their job to attach a flotation collar to the space capsule and to stay with it until the capsule was safely picked up. The first face every astronaut saw upon returning from space was a man from the underwater demolition teams. Although waterborne recoveries are a thing of the past, Navy SEALs continue serving NASA in new capacities. In December 1988, Commander William Shepard became the first Navy SEAL to launch into space. His flight as a mission specialist aboard the Atlantis broke ground on a new frontier for future SEAL operations. The conventional military establishment has always been jealous of the manpower and money special warfare groups take from its regular branches. When the creation of SEAL teams was given a high presidential priority for both men and equipment, there was bound to be trouble. Roy Bowen, the first acting commanding officer of SEAL Team 2, explains how SEAL teams came about. Under President Kennedy, more emphasis was put on unconventional warfare. To uh, modify this really required special training. Under the old system, we were only allowed to go to the berm line. Of course, we violated this continuously. But this new concept gave us any place, sea, air, or land. In the beginning, we took every job and tailor-made that job for that particular mission. This required that I send people to uh, learn how to hot uh, wire cars, uh, locks, uh, sailing, because of Vietnam coming up, and uh, I sent advisors in to the junk force for that. So this entire year was a year of training and, and getting ready for the commissioning. Now when we, we went into commission, uh, we had pretty much a license to mold this concept as, as we desired or as we felt our needs was. We had very little guidance. So I came out with a sort of dirty dozen concept. And 
I had been enlisted with all of the original SEALs in SEAL Team 2, and I knew what their capabilities was, and I sent them to Rangers School, uh, Halo with a high altitude, low opening, uh, made parachutists out of them, uh, sent them to jail to learn tricks from other people so that they had, we had a, a very background. Of course, martial arts was part of it. And we trained all of these individuals and cross-trained them so that one could cover the other. Now we were, this was uh, under a cloak of secrecy. Even the people I worked for didn't know, or didn't have a need to know, is what I was told. So I, uh, it kind of put us in a, in an unusual spot where, here I was working for a man. He said, "Well, what are you doing this for, or what are you doing that for?" And I couldn't tell him. And uh, after a while, I enjoyed not telling him. <laughs> SEAL Team 1 and SEAL Team 2 were commissioned by presidential order in January 1962. The original SEAL teams were made of 60 men each, 10 officers and 50 enlisted men. Team 1 was stationed at the Coronado, California Amphibious Base, where they trained for upcoming operations in Asia and the Pacific. SEAL Team 2 was stationed at Little Creek Amphibious Base in Virginia. Team 2's designated area of operation was to be Europe in the Caribbean. The men of the newly created SEAL teams were chosen from the ranks of the existing underwater demolition teams. SEALs and UDTs were the same men, but on a different mission. UDTs would continue to perform reconnaissance missions, beach surveys, mine clearing, channel blasting, demolition work, and all other jobs they had done in the past. UDT men would continue to operate in the maritime environment. SEALs took their name from the sea, air, and land, the three mediums in which they would operate. The SEALs' primary function was performing commando-type missions. Besides the specialized training that went into making a SEAL, special equipment was required. Sometimes existing weapons and gear were modified to suit SEAL needs. Often, equipment was acquired by unorthodox means. Lieutenant Commander Boehm explains the problems he encountered while equipping the first SEAL teams. Well, President Kennedy evidently investigated and found out I had five formal boards of investigation pending. A violation of diving uh, safety, open purchasing rig, uh, closed circuit rigs that had not gone through uh, experimental diving from Emerson. Uh, open purchase in the AR-15 from Cooper McDonald without going through Buell Webbs who wanted me to take the M-14 because we didn't have a supply system backing it up. Modifying a halo parachute without going through either Pioneer or El Centro. I took the explosive pack off. I made free falls out of some of them, static lines out of others because I needed a parachute that had a steerable capability and would support a man that had excessive weight. So, uh, oh, and I put a patented pop-off valve from another company on an Emerson rig, which was a no-no. Uh, these five things, all of them were formal boards of investigation pending court-martials. I figured, well, I'm not, my career is coming to an end, but I always had, you know, I could have gone with Link. <laughs> As, uh, I'd been invited to go with him, and I said, well, we'll, we'll do what we have to do. Well, that took place, and uh, Admiral Taylor asked me, he says, Roy, he says, do you have civilian clothes? I says, oh, yes, sir, I just bought a new suit from Sears with a hat and a red feather in it. He says, you can leave the hat and the red feather. And I met him, we flew into, uh, flew to Washington, and I met with the president. Uh, well, I didn't know where I was going or why I was going, I, and knowing the admiral, I, I, I didn't ask. I figured he'd tell me when he wanted me to, and the next thing I saw the president, and <laughs> I didn't know what to say. 
so I told them I hadn't voted for him. Uh, he said, unfortunately, everyone has it. Well, fortunately, the man was, uh, was so charming. Uh, he had the ability, the charisma, to disarm you completely. I still wouldn't have voted for him, but I'd have died for him. Anyway, it was shortly after that that all the formal boards of investigation seemed to drop. Both SEAL teams were fully operational within weeks of being commissioned. SEAL Team 2 sent swimmers in and out of Cuba after the Bay of Pigs invasion and throughout the Cuban Missile Crisis. Mobile training teams from Team 2 trained NATO forces in Norway, Greece, and Turkey. Meanwhile, SEAL Team 1 became embroiled in the war in Vietnam. The initial SEAL mission was that of a mobile training unit. SEAL advisors trained their South Vietnamese counterparts in clandestine operations, sabotage, and guerrilla warfare. As the war dragged on, the lines between advising and operating began to blur. By 1966, SEAL Team 1 was openly involved in active combat roles throughout the Rungsat Special Zone. Early the following year, SEAL Team 2 sent its first two platoons to Vietnam. The primary SEAL role in Vietnam was counterinsurgency, to defend freedom by helping the South Vietnamese ward off the communist-backed Viet Cong guerrillas. Trained and equipped to conduct unconventional warfare and clandestine operations, SEALs were tasked with maintaining capabilities in demolitions, intelligence, and the infiltration and exfiltration of agents and guerrillas. SEAL platoons concentrated mainly on listening posts and ambush-type operations in remote areas where Viet Cong moved regularly with impunity. SEALs sought out, seized, and destroyed caches of enemy weapons. In the Vietnamese language, Rung Sat means forest of assassins. The SEALs who operated in this dismal mangrove swamp made sure that the area lived up to its name. The ambush became the primary SEAL operation SEALs specialized in capturing or killing enemy officers deep in enemy-held territory. Working at night, far from the main rivers and trails, SEALs set up ambushes along suspected paths of enemy movement. Through prisoner snatches and the neutralization of enemy sympathizers, SEALs steadily chipped away at the VC infrastructure. The Viet Cong learned to fear the men with green faces who would strike suddenly and disappear like ghosts. Vietnam-era SEALs carry the mystique of being somehow special. It's because they truly were. In a world dominated by push-button warfare, SEALs in Vietnam remained hands-on specialists. They were trained assassins with an eye for arteries. They possessed a talent for choking off screams. SEALs knew how to support the body so that it didn't thunk as it hit the ground. They heard the gasp. They felt the shudders. or water, SEALs brought a personal war to the enemy with deadly results. War reports tally a kill ratio of over 100 enemy dead for every SEAL fatality. Fewer than 200 SEALs ever operated in Vietnam during any given period, but SEAL accomplishments are legendary. Along with nearly 1,000 other awards, SEAL teams boast three Medal of Honor winners. Navy SEALs earned more medals per capita than any other unit in the war. Despite the unpopularity of the war, SEAL honors suggest the SEALs maintained their enthusiasm for the program. Commander Roy Baum explains how SEAL leadership contributed to morale. I was able to put 30 years in and never tell a man to do anything that I had not done myself. But I was fast approaching the point where I would have to do that when I retired. The uh, leadership is... is uh, is what we all talk about. 
the greatest thing is followership. Followership is an earned thing. People don't demand respect. They earn respect. Uh, the respect that my men had for me solved any problems that I might have. I uh, had a mission one time and I asked them, I said, I need 13 volunteers. And I'm not guaranteeing you a round trip on this one. And uh, I guess the greatest honor I'd ever had was the entire team stepped forward. So, you say leadership? No, followership. SEALs operated in Vietnam for 10 years, from 1962 through 1972. During this time, UDT SEAL training was modified to include extensive weapons familiarization and firing exercises. Emphasis was placed on helicopter operations, such as insertion by rappelling and extraction by Maguire rig. Field operations on land included ambush and counter-ambush training. Additional instruction was given on the use of explosives and booby traps. Improvements in weapons, diving gear, and SDVs are all offshoots of this era. Every president since John F. Kennedy has preferred, whenever possible, to use the scalpel of special operations rather than the blunter tools of conventional warfare. So it's not surprising that the Reagan administration gave top priority to rebuilding special forces which had been neglected in the post-Vietnam era. UDT SEAL teams were in a position to expand if they were given the right mission. With no wars to fight, Commander Richard Marcinko campaigned the Pentagon to let SEALs use their special skills to fight terrorism. In November 1980, a covert counterterrorism unit, SEAL Team 6, was created. Marcinko was its first commanding officer. For the third time since the establishment of the first NCDUs, a UDT SEAL commander would reinvent the teams. When you're on the line like SEAL Team 6, which now was a full command, a how to respond, full bag deployment within four hours, anywhere in the world. So we had four hours to get somewhere. It meant that everybody had to have their own equipment. In the era up to that point, we followed the, the foundation of the teams of a swim buddy, swim pair that became a squad, a, a platoon, and the UDT was a, a platoon that did a beach survey. When Roy made SEALs, then it went in squad and platoons that were patrolling dimensions. Uh, SEAL Team 6 went in pairs of the swim buddy system for door entry. The size of the patrol now is based on a target. If it was a underway love boat, basically needed a whole command to swarm a ship. If it was an oil rig that was a smaller group, like about 40 people, if you went down to just hostage rescue in a building or an aircraft, again, based on the amount of terrorists, the amount of hostages, you know, you package the deal. So instead of being platoons, fire teams, I had groups. And, and the, the basic groups originally were 30-man groups uh, that trained together and they broke down into the boats that we fought out of, originally the whalers and then cigarette boats, called uh, boat crews. Where it comes probably the foundations that change dramatically are the equipping. Originally, the teams had a sub-ops sub division that maintained all the diving equipment, and air ops that did all the parachute division, you know, all the parachute work. What that allowed is, is that when you want to go for a swim, you go to sub ops, you draw a lung, and you go for a dive. If the lung didn't work, or you didn't, something was wrong with you, you go say, I don't know, the lung didn't work. Or if it's a parachute, I don't pack this damn thing, but it didn't work. Because of the criticality of having every shooter on the ground performing, I bought everybody their own parachute, their own weapons package, their own diving equipment, their own skis, so that every man now had his own equipment locker. And the man was now part of the system. If he failed, it was because he failed. 
There was no, no, no more passing the blame to somebody saying, ah, shucks, it broke. He didn't take care of his equipment. But that meant that we were mobile because of the philosophy of the mission is more important than the safety, that we are in combat. Six and counterterrorism is in combat every day. Not like waiting for the 120 days warm up of we're going to war in Vietnam, we're going to war in somewhere, you know, now we can cheat a little bit. We broke safety regulations every day in everything we did. And our dives on O2 rebreathers on the Drago R5, we were going too deep, too hard, too fast. And I was told to change the diving logs because we were breaking the rules. And I refused to. And I forced the Navy labs to go through and say, Jesus, maybe we've got to change the tables. But that caused more bureaucratic ripples in terms of what can the man endure, and, and that's what we worked hard on. The man now was the attack weapon, and the system was there to provide, you know, vice versa. The criteria hiring people for six broke a lot of rules in that my first priority was combat. We had a bullet gone past their head with their name on it, and I bought those guys first. The next thing I bought was trade skills, kids that had worked somewhere as in union labor, so that in a terrorist event, they were either an electrician or a bricklayer or somebody. I could send them in, and they could fake maintenance and would actually learn what's going on in there, what kind of weapons did they have, how many of the bad guys were there, and what's going on. And the following was, was linguistical skills, which started off under Roy Blom and SEAL Team 2, Team 1 era, uh, high priority, but then went downhill. Went downhill in terms of there were other things to do, there's a Vietnam War, uh, you lost the troop for three, six, eight months, and, and there was no program to maintain proficiency in, in the language. So I got people that, that had language skills so that they could listen and tell me what the hell's going on in life because I couldn't tell. The one bubble that probably broke everybody's back was that uh, I had my own pilots. And my own pilots were enlisted men, which the Navy still says is verboten. An enlisted man can't be smart enough to fly an airplane. It defies their policy. Well, I always felt that one, uh, a SEAL is smart. Two, I wanted a shooter so that when you're landing the aircraft to come into an airport scenario, that they would park the plane to a tactical advantage and that they'd pick up their gun and go to work. Having a training allowance of bullets that was more than the whole Marine Corps per year uh, shook the tree. Uh, I've been accused of having a blank check. I didn't know how to justify everything. It was more money than either group had, and I was only one command. But I, I staffed it, I said I need, and I earned it. Uh, my initial argument was, you plan to lose 24 F-16s every year off a flight deck. For three F-16s, I will give you this. The Navy was required to provide that capability, and for three planned crashes, I will give them a capability. The other teams, instead of fighting me, I say fighting me, saying that that was wrong, should have said, if Dick Marcinko needs that, so do we. Uh, we don't have a four-hour recall, but we may have a four-week recall, and I'd be ready to go and do transition on that gear. Well, well, today, X years later, met much of the equipment that I originally got for six, now every team has. The fast ropes, the special boats, the communications equipment. I mean, it's all come around, uh, finally. But why do we have to wait? 10 years to do that. I mean, it should have caught on the next year saying, if that band of merry men needs that many dollars and that many bullets, then probably I need to have them too. The relentless pursuit of his goals polarized anyone who had contact with Marcinko. The mention of his name can still evoke controversy within the SEAL community. Yet even his greatest critics are forced to acknowledge his accomplishments. SEAL Team 6 was not just another SEAL team with a specialized mission. It was a new kind of SEAL team. Historically, UDTs and SEALs had trained together, and often they operated together. As distinctions between the two groups began to blur, the Navy consolidated the teams. 
In May 1983, the underwater demolition teams were decommissioned. The UDT men were assigned to either SEAL teams or SDV teams. The increase in the number of SEALs forced the creation of several new SEAL teams. By 1989, the West Coast was home to SEAL teams 1, 3, and 5, plus SDV team 1. The East Coast was home base to SEAL teams 2, 4, 6, and 8, plus SDV team 2. The increased number of teams allows modern SEAL teams to become more geographically and functionally oriented. SEAL teams now develop operational and language skills specifically targeted toward their expected areas of deployment. Although the United States was officially at peace during the decade, SEAL teams continued to see action throughout the 1980s. The 1983 invasion of Grenada marked the first use of SEAL teams by the Joint Special Operations Command. Poor planning on the part of senior commanders caused needless casualties among the SEALs. Despite their losses, SEAL Team 4 and SEAL Team 6 managed to overcome tremendous obstacles and salvage their missions. In 1985, SEAL Team 6 was sent to intervene during the hijacking of the cruise ship, the Achille Lauro. At the decade's end, December 1989, SEAL Team 2 and SEAL Team 4 were called into action in Panama. SEAL Team 2 put enemy patrol boats out of commission with timed explosive charges. SEAL Team 4 was tasked with securing Patilla Airport to prevent General Noriega's escape. Working under restrictive rules of engagement designed to prevent collateral damage, Navy SEALs succeeded in both missions. The operation at the airfield sustained a casualty rate of over 50%, causing many to wonder about the future of SEAL operations. Just over a year later, Navy SEALs distinguished themselves in the Gulf War by destroying mines, capturing oil platforms, and seizing the first Kuwaiti land liberated by Allied forces. SEALs in fast attack vehicles roamed the landscape, illuminating missile targets with laser beams. A handful of SEALs managed to fake an amphibious landing by using timed explosive charges. This deceived two Iraqi divisions into moving out of position and into the phony invasion area. The rebound success of SEALs in the Gulf War is an example of how SEAL operations work best when kept small. Lessons from Panama showed that multi-platoon SEAL operations in a hostile area don't work. The unit is too large for surprise and too small to dominate. After operating for seven months in a war zone, SEALs returned home from the Persian Gulf without a single casualty. With the demise of communism in Europe, many foresaw an era of worldwide peace. As nations worked toward that goal, Americans continued to call on Navy SEALs. As one SEAL puts it, we all pray for peace, but if there is a war, we want a peace. What jazzes me the most would be uh, one shot, one kill at a thousand yards head. Formed only four years ago, SEAL Team 8 is the newest SEAL team. Commander Tom Katana tells what it means to be a modern SEAL during peacetime. Probably the biggest difference between SEALs of the 1960s in Vietnam and the SEALs of today. In the 1960s, SEALs had an idea of what they were training for and where they were going. They were going to the Southeast Asia, and they had an idea who the enemy was, enemy was and how they were going to have to fight him. The problem that we're seeing today is that you have the same motivated people. As I mentioned before, they're, they're smarter, faster, and stronger than they've ever been. They're the highest quality of military personnel I've ever seen. I've done a two-year attachment with the British Special Forces. I've worked around the world. Uh, these guys are good, and they're getting even better every year. The only problem that they lack is that they are focusing so much on the technical aspects of being a SEAL, of getting stronger, of getting smarter, but they have no focus, no combat focus. Uh, to be able to make sure that these guys are not only just strong and bright, you also have to make sure that they have that, that razor-sharp edge, that they'll be able to go into combat and be sharp. That's tough. We try to make sure that each of the individuals here not only have the, the equipment and the focus 
on what they may encounter in the future, but they keep that, that combat edge of knowing that what they're doing is not just for training. There's a fine line in training between building somebody up and tearing, tearing them down. The uh, basic underwater demolition school in Coronado has a unique job, at least from my perspective, it's a schoolhouse that's designed to fail people because the intention of the school is to get everybody to a point where they're going to decide to do one of two things, and that's either quit or go on. And once you've been able to identify that core group of people who've decided that no matter how bad, how wet, how cold, how totally miserable they are, that they're going to go on, then you start building them up. And that's what BUDS basically does in six months, is decides who is it that possesses that, basically the right stuff. And then once they get to a team, we'll add and start building them up. So I see the purpose of basic underwater demolition SEAL training is the same as it was in Vietnam. Find out who's going to stick with you when the going gets real tough. Once you've identified who that person is, you can train them to do anything. SEALs work on a daily basis uh, not because they love to train, is they would actually like to go out and, and apply their trade in, a, in an environment. They'd like to serve the country, they'd like to test themselves individually, they would like to be able to do for real what they train on and train for on a daily basis. Uh, I am the end user, I am where the rubber meets the road. I try to make sure that my superiors know that if there is any contingency that requires a special operations team, that my people are ready, willing, and fully ready to perform in any way that they're called upon to. Uh, but again, I may only suggest that uh, my team be employed. I'm the end user. Uh, I'm the one who's tasked with the message. It's not really my position to go out and, and broker for jobs, though we're ready. Yeah, we're geographically and functionally oriented. If something happens in somebody else's area of operation, it's not going to be me. It's frustrating to the guys who are trained up and ready to go, but uh, unless there's something major where the, more than one team is required to support it, uh, it'll depend on which team has that area of uh, focus. Not necessarily specialization, but area of focus. Um, my team happens to be in support of the Yukon southern region and the Mediterranean uh, what that basically boils down to is we deploy forces in support of carrier battle group operations, battle groups that are currently in the Adriatic off the coast of Yugoslavia. So a lot of my guys are uh, anxiously waiting to see how the political situation develops there. I think I've been in command for approximately uh, 16 months, and if I had a crystal ball, I think I would be the best commanding officer of a SEAL team. Don't have it, and in the absence of a crystal ball, the best thing I could say is not knowing where the threat is going to be or what the threat is going to be. Uh, as long as we remain extremely flexible, highly adaptable, and very mobile, I think the combination of those three things as well as looking back on some Vietnam principles of being able to shoot, move, and communicate. You combine that with the requirements of the future, uh, I think we're going to be able to quickly adapt in a very flexible manner any type of threat that might come up in the future. Uh, with the lack of clarity of what's happening in the world and who's the bad guy and who's the good guy, I think the best that we can do down in the SEAL team is, is live up to our name, is be capable operators in the sea, air, and land. And as long as we'll be able to adjust on a moment's notice, I think we'll be the force of choice for the future. There were three phases. Actually, uh, each one of these phases had uh, a lot of people involved in it. For example, uh, Fain, uh, Doug Fain, uh, he brought us into the underwater phase of it. He advanced that phase from the naked warrior to to a man that was capable of swimming without bubbles uh, on on a closed circuit oxygen breathing apparatus. So this advanced us along this line. But for every step forward that we were taken, we were taken two backwards in some of the situations because we would have the concept that Doug developed and uh, then we would lose the monetary support for that program. So Doug really got us into the underwater phase of this. And I came along and I said, okay, I'll get us into the unconventional end of this thing uh, where we're not restricted by the existing rules of uh, engagement that the amphibious force had for the underwater demolition team at that time. So I started us in that direction. 
Uh, this lasted through Vietnam. Dick Marcinko came along, and he started us in another, the terrorist end of it, which is where we we are heading right now. Uh, these are people that had the forethought to see, was able to see what was coming down the, the pike and uh, had the intestinal fortitude to do something about it. The moral courage. Now, uh, moral courage is explained as a person that will do what he thinks is right regardless of the consequences to himself. It's paraphrased quite often. He's got a hard head. And I guess I better not say, stinking butt. share a proud history with roots that stretch back 50 years. Through war and peace times, the teams have constantly redefined themselves in order to survive. In a world of change, seals have proven themselves to be an adaptable species. If the past is an indicator, the survival of the teams will rely on seal leaders who can embrace and implement change. Men of vision and courage who dare to do what is right instead of doing what is expedient. My most important thing is to get the mission done and be a complete professional. We do everything extremely well here in SEAL Team, and we're not going to have anybody to track by saying, well, you're second best. Well, we're not second best. We're the best, and we know it. But again, we're not going to go out there and try to prove it. We know in a modern warfare, it's not like Korea and Vietnam, where there's so much to do out there. The SEALs went into an area that no one was in yet. They went into the Mekong Delta, they went into the rivers and said, hey, we're going to take this mission over. Well, now you don't see that. What you see now is you see uh, a small sliver of the pie, say, and everybody wants to jam their forces into that sliver of the pie. So when you have an operation like Desert Storm, not everybody can go. And there aren't missions for everybody, but everybody wants to go there so they can get more money, so they can get medals, and they can all look like heroes. It's just the way the military is. The Marines want to go because they know they're the best. The Air Force wants to go. The Army wants to go. The Rangers want to go. The Green Berets want to go. Delta Force wants to go. SEALs want to go. And every SEAL team wants to go. But we can't all fit into this small spot. So what we do is we try to push our way in there, and sometimes we don't make it because the Navy SEALs are the smallest component of spec ops. Well, that's not what I'm really here for. I'm waiting for a war where we can apply ourselves and show everybody how good we are. And that's the key to SEAL Team. I say mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. Uh, old Latin proverb, I'm, I am, you know, my fault, my fault, my most grievous fault. I am uh, guilty of putting mission first. I'm guilty of putting my men first. I'm guilty of putting the Navy behind the families because the Navy doesn't do shit. The families do. Uh, I am guilty of wrenching the system. Uh, I am guilty of intimidating, trotting, beating, thumping bureaucratic assholes. I am guilty of being disrespectful. I am guilty of taking what I want and screw the world. Uh, I'm guilty of being a special operator. Uh, I was built by design, by definition, to work around the world on whatever I found on the ground to kick ass and take names. Didn't say how to be in the jungle. If I did it in the bureaucracy, if I did it in the industrial world, if I did it in urban world, that is special operations. If I beat you in the head with a missile or a shit can, dead is dead. I'm supposed to be trained to use whatever is available to me to accomplish my mission. As a commanding officer, my mission is to get better missions. What's a better mission? A better mission is it kills more bad guys, more harder targets, and bring back my guys alive. In order to do that, I need to have better intelligence and better equipment. In order to get that, I gotta thump bureaucratic twits, dweebs, nothings, that sit behind 
with a cup of coffee in our hand, sitting there saying, does he really mean that he did this? Who gives a shit? Walk where I walked and find out. The bottom line is there were guns back in Vietnam and there were SEALs back in Vietnam. Today there are different guns but, and different SEALs, but the basic SEAL is the same individual that you saw in the 1960s. It's just where he operates. Uh, we have teams that operate above the Arctic Circle that uh, employ snowshoes and skis working in the Arctic environment. Uh, using different weapons and different communications. But again, what drives all the communications, and whether it's in the jungles or, uh, of South America, whether it's in the Arctic north of Norway, it's still the individual who, who pushes that equipment, uses that equipment. So the locality and the type of equipment has changed, but the individual guy is still the same. I know. I, I didn't consider any of it dangerous, really. It was just what we were supposed to do. We were trained to do it. And it just... But we do no different, do no more danger in doing anything else in the Navy as far as I was concerned. We were just, uh, in fact, we felt we were above danger. And uh, we were making, uh, we were putting other people into danger. We, we knew how to take care of ourselves. Never thought about it. If you thought about it, get out. Go join the Boy Scouts. That's all I had to tell anybody.